acute heart failure treatment, the current status, that means that we have to look at uh, the guidelines to see what we are doing. We know that uh, acute heart failure is not a disease. Actually, heart failure isn't a disease. So uh, when we're talking about uh, acute heart failure, it's a, lots of disease endpoints coming together, and we have now a common presentation. There are different etiologies, types, and hemodynamic subtypes to uh, look at. So when we are talking about treating a patient, we might be treating a patient with high blood pressure and a low cardiac output or other way around. We can have a patient with a low cardiac output and a high, uh, or vice versa. So it depends on the kind of uh, etiology that we've got. It depends on the rapidity of the deterioration that we are seeing, the cause or an underlying cause, and then we can choose what kind of treatment we are going to use to help this patient. We know that despite all the advances that we've got, acute heart failure is a major cause of in-hospital and out-hospital mortality and morbidity. We've seen this slide before. I just wanted to mention that in a disease that uh, outnumbers cancer in killing patients. Acute heart failure is really the bad guy. It's even worse than chronic heart failure. So when we have acute heart failure, the chance of dying is even higher. And heart failure itself is the one that's killing patients right now. So uh, sorry for the change in design, but uh, there are four strategies that we have to look at. The Im immediate life-threatening situation that we've got, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, if there is a low blood pressure, or if we are uh, facing an arrhythmia, all of these should be addressed first, because if we don't do that, we're going to lose the patient. We have to look at the underlying cause. As Professor Sanderson did mention, we could have a pulmonary emboli, we could have an acute valvular dysfunction, and we can have an acute coronary syndrome. And each one of these needs a different kind of approach. You can't treat them all together. Uh, the per precipitating factors are very important, uh, sometimes even more important than the heart failure itself, because uh, Although you try to treat the heart failure, until that precipitating factor is still there, the patient doesn't do good. So you'll have a patient with pneumonia and heart failure, and you're going to give diuretics and try to treat that patient, but it won't work because that patient uh, has to be treated for the uh, precipitating factor also. And as we have been told, after discharge, these patients don't do good. So you have to have a planning program for long-term management post-discharge. Some of the subtypes that we can have in an acute heart failure situation, we have the acute decompensated congestive heart failure. We have the hypertension or hypertensive crisis patient. We have the pulmonary edema patient, the cardiogenic shock, low cardiac output, severe cardiogenic shock, and high output failure here, and also the involvement of the right side, which I would say is, if not rising, but we are being more uh, informed about it, and we are seeing more patients with right-sided heart failure. What I wanted to show here was uh, the differences that we have, let's say, in the cardiac index or the blood pressure. So these all could be an uh, acute heart failure patient, but they are quite different. So we can't give one formula to, okay, do these five steps and the patient will be good. So you have to see which kind of uh, patient you're dealing with and then try to treat them. This was shown right now, but uh, what I wanted to show is that although there is lots of mortality here and although there are lots of similarities, the real uh, problem lies here. We don't have pathophysiologic targets to aim at to, de uh, to treat these patients. That's why we don't have level A evidence to treat these patients, and that's why we don't have beneficial acts to help them. That's because we don't know what we are treating, or we don't have a very clear picture of what we're tre treating. And I hope that in Professor Hopper's lecture, we'll be finding some answers to these questions. This slide here is for, um, I didn't put it here to 
get, give you a kind of algorithm to come down. Sometimes in emergency wards, after getting the f history and physical exam, we'll go straight for an echocardiography if we got the uh, sign and symptoms. So, but uh, what I wanted to show was that here, the anti-pro-BMP level, or the pro-BMP level, is uh, different from the chronic side of this. So uh, here, we anticipate to see higher levels of this biomarker to help us get to the diagnosis. And as I said, depending on which situation and where you're practicing, you might go straight for an echo when you've got a patient in distress and severe heart failure symptoms are there. Or even start treating, actually, before you do the echo. These are the usually leading to rapid deterioration events, and these are those who are not so rapidly deteriorating, but you should remember that this uh, classification isn't always true. In um, infective endocarditis, we could have a rupture of the mitral valve and then suddenly the patient goes into pulmonary edema and we'll lose the patient if we can't do anything. And uh, here down in the drug abuse uh, group, we could have uh, some drugs that cause rapid heart failure Right now, the amphetamines and draviates that are being used, we have lots of them in Iran also, so uh, we are seeing patients that go into heart failure after using one of these drugs, and that isn't very good. Uh, and up here, again, when we talk about mechanical complications of acute coronary syndrome and talk about rupture of the intraventricular septum or the mitral valve, uh, the mitral valve could rupture by itself if the patient has an MVP. So don't look for an infarction to uh, be sure that there is a mitral valve rupture. It could happen any time in patients. Actually, we had a patient, uh, the father of the representative of ProGraph that we are using for transplantation, and she came into my office with tears in her eyes that my father has cancer, lung cancer. And when we saw the CT, and that was what was, they had done for the patient, it was just congestion. And they had diagnosed the patient with cancer. We treated him, and then he went to the surgery, and he's doing what, quite fine right now. So when I got this slide, I, I, I was really um, happy about it first, because it says hospitalization recommended and hospitalization should be considered. But when I went through the details of it, I couldn't make myself to say that these patients don't really need to be hospitalized or there's a chance of not hospitalizing them. So if you have a patient with heart failure, no matter what signs or symptoms, if they are not doing well, do do consider hospitalization, do hospitalize them. I wouldn't dare to not or only consider uh, uh, hospitalizing a patient with pneumonia. I would, uh, you'll lose him in the time you're considering hospitalization. Or let's say with a pulmonary emboli with signs of heart failure. That patient should go for uh, invasive kind of treatment. So uh, what I want to say on this slide now is don't think about this. Really, you should go for hospitalization when you've got signs and symptoms that you can think that will put your patient at risk. These are some of the prognostic risk factors we've got. And if I'm not talking about treatment, because just as Professor Sanderson said, we don't have level A evidence-based medicines. I'll go into the medicines a little bit later, but these are the prognostic factors. Systolic blood pressure, if it's high, you've got a better prognosis. Uh, coronary artery disease would make the prognosis worse. Increased troponin, BUN, hyponatremia. It was very interesting to hear from our colleague from Japan, Professor Huri, that Talvaptan could treat uh, hyponatremia. But the question is, if we treat it, do we make the prognosis better or not? This is one of the questions that comes up. But all the time, hyponatremia is something very hard to treat. We have the natriuretic peptides, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, Functional capacity is one of the things that we should look at all the time, one of the indices that we can use. Although New York Heart Association functional class that we really look at something very uh, solid and we can use it, we think we can use it. There was a paper from Mayo Clinic that showed that when you give a case to doctors, they give you different uh, classes of New York Heart Association. So it's not really that rock solid. And other things like LVEF and it's 
down here, the EF is down here, anemia, diabetes, uh, new sustained arrhythmias, and not using a neurohormonal uh, kind of medication. So you get the patient in the emergency ward, you do the workup that you have to do, history, physical exam, chest x-ray, EKG, an echocardiogram or a BMP or both, usually both happens if you've got them, blood chemistry and all of these, and then you have to decide, and that this is emergency going ahead, not uh, a decision of that you've got lots of time, that does the patient need ventilation support? Does he need arrhythmia control? Is there a need for vasoconstriction? Or otherwise, do we need to use a, a vasodilator? Do we have an acute coronary syndrome and go for a repair fusion or revas revascularization? And at last, is there a mechanical kind of cause that is uh, causing this uh, acute heart failure? And then again, I don't know why they brought the echo down here again, because we have to have done it before. But what kind of medication or treatment are we going to use for them? This not, might not be appropriate place for this slide, but it's quite easy and it's quite easy to use. When you've got a patient with heart failure, uh, you can divide them into four groups. Do they have congestion and do they have a low perfusion? And if they do have uh, congestion, you have to go for treating the, with diuretics. And if you have uh, low perfusion, you have to try to improve the cardiac output with different kinds of medications. We've seen this, but what I wanted to point out was the prevention of thromboembolism. Uh, when you read the guidelines, it's usually focusing on atrial fibrillation, but down at the end you'll see that there is venous thromboembolism prophylaxis also. So uh, these patients are at high risk for venous thromboembolism. And even if they're in uh, sinus rhythm, you should go for a kind of prophylaxis because they can, after a while, develop a pulmonary uh, emboli and then get worse. And as we said, we, we treat the immediate killing situation. We go for stabilization and giving better um, medicines, trying to use those medicines that we know can uh, modify the course of the disease and then go for the long-term follow-up here. Um, this can't be read, but what we were go uh, what is uh, shown here are the medications that we are. Could we change this one? Nobody here. So the medications that we are using are. Actually, those that we talked about in chronic heart failure, we, uh, in the stable patient, so we will be using beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, digoxin, diuretics. And in the acute phase, first of all, we'll go for uh, diuretics, we'll use vasodilators, we might use vasopressors if the patient is sick, and then uh, all together we'll try to put these medications together. And then there's the non-pharmacologic, and really, uh, I really do apologize, but this isn't the way we, I made them. And in the non-pharmacological group, uh, what we have to do is to consider the patient for fluid and sodium uh, retention kind of therapy to take away the sodium and take away the fluid, if possible. We have to look for uh, if the patient needs an assist device, permanent or non-permanent. And then we have to look uh, to do other kinds of uh, evaluations and go for uh, transplantation in the end if we can't do anything. But when we talk, all of these have been mentioned in previous studies for the non-invasive and the invasive kinds of ventilation or VADs. The only topic that wasn't touched was transplantation, I think. And then transplantation in an acute setting is really a problem because the availability is very important. You need to have... Oh, thank you. That was good. The transplantation is a problem because the availability of transplantation, that doesn't mean only the program that we have to have a transplant program, but the feasibility of doing a transplant in a very sick patient, and then the reversibility. There's always a question of reversibility in cases, just like the postpartum cardiomyopathies or the, cardiomyo the acute myocarditis patients. Okay, thank you. And the reversibility is a very uh, important issue 
perhaps if you do have a VAT program and a transplant program, you won't have to think about that really. But for example, a 17-year-old uh, girl in diabetic keto ketoacidosis was brought to our hospital. After a very prolonged CPR, she uh, gained back her consciousness. She had a spinal injury because of the hypoxia. She had, that was the uh, duration of our CPR. And she had an EF of about 15%. For the first few days, we, are, we were treating pulmonary edema. She was in and out of it because they were trying to treat the ketoacidosis also. But now the EF is 50, you know, after a few weeks. So the reversibility there, and I think that was a hibernation because of the prolong prolonged CPR. So transplantation, if available, if feasible, and if you're sure that it, the case is not reversible or you can't wait until it does reverse, should be considered if you don't have a VAT program. To determine which patients aren't doing good or might not do good, there are lots of risk scores, and they can help you, but that's not, uh, they aren't golden rules, but they can help you in deciding. Most of them are for chronic heart failures. We have two here for acute decompensated heart failure. This one is quite easy. When you get the patient in, we have the BUN as the first first thing that we have to study. If we have a low BUN and a good blood pressure, the patient is low risk and you've got the mortality by risk group here. If you've got a low blood pressure or a high uh, BUN here, you have to go for, uh, sorry, if you have a high B blood pressure and a low, then we'll get here. And at the end of this, when we have a very high BUN, a low blood pressure and an increased serum creatinine, you'll be in the high risk group. So by just getting two or three factors together, you can decide which patient is doing better. And this can help you in making decisions as how to treat the patient. We don't have level of A evidence for what to do, but we do have a level of A evidence for not what to do. So do not give glitazones for treating diabetes in these patients. That would be very bad. It could worsen the heart failure and heart hospitalization. Calcium channel blockers also in SAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors. And do not add ARB to ACE inhibitors because that could cause more problems than uh, good effects. So this is one of the things that we should consider. The diuretics that we are using, frosamide is what the diuretic that is being used most. There are some papers uh, that say trosamide might, might be better, but uh, actually I think most of the countries are using frosamide at the first line here. Metalazone is a very good drug to add on if you have a low GFR. It could help in reducing the congestion. That is very important. One of the things that was said uh, and is in the guidelines that you should uh, start frosamide if the patient is taking it before with a two and a half times the dose that the patient was taking at home. So let's say if he's on 80 milligrams of furosemide outside, now you have to go for something around 200 milligrams. But uh, if you give that in bolus doses, you might cause a drop in blood pressure. I know there's no difference between uh, infusion and bolus doses in terms of mortality, but perhaps there's a slight difference when you're treating a borderline hypotensive patient and you want to give high doses. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is about spironolactone. Here we've got the doses, we know that it is anti-fibrotic, it uh, prevents fibrosis in the heart, but uh, when we want to use it as a diuretic, we have to go for higher doses. One of the problems that might arise is when we have uh, hepatic congestion, and when we, you've got hepatic congestion, uh, you have to even use higher doses. So remember, if you've got a patient in heart failure and you're going to use spironolactone as a diuretic, uh, consider higher doses to use. As I said, we are using uh, lots of uh, inotropic agents, different ones in different places. Uh, some of them need a loading dose, some of them don't need a loading dose. Depending on the situation, you have to choose one of these to start treating. One of the things that you should remember is that perhaps when we are giving these, although we are 
making the patient better for a few hours or temporarily, but we are killing the myocytes. And the myocytes will, uh, and that's why at the end of the day, we are not doing very good. So these are medications that should be used only when the, we are losing the patient to save him. And one of the other things that I wanted to mention is, Although in the guidelines, and I did check the guidelines again, there is a loading dose for milvenin, but the, the loading dose will cause uh, hypotension. So in most of the patients, it's better to avoid giving the loading dose and go for the, uh, the, only the infusion that is here. Levozimindan is very expensive, not available in all countries, but uh, in cases that you are uh, available to use it, you should remember that usually you shouldn't infuse it for more than 12 to 24 hours. It has got very long half-life half metabolites, so we have to consider not giving it for a very long period. These two guys down here, norepinephrine and epinephrine, that means that we're in big trouble when we're using them. So we have to, uh, when, when we do start using this, the patient isn't really good and going towards cardiogenic shock actually. The last thing that I wanted to mention before the last procedure was the non-invasive, because I know we're going to talk about it later, but the, or, uh, is the non-invasive um, ventilation programs that there are. They might not affect the seven days, 30 day or long-term mor morbidity and mortality, but they have an effect on stabilizing the patient, and that is very important. Unfortunately, most of the cardiologists don't like to bother themselves with a respiratory device. They think it's something that the pulmonologist should do. But when we are treating heart failure, it's better to get all the aspects together and do it ourselves because the pulmonologist won't know the other aspects of heart failure. The different kinds of uh, non-invasive ventilation don't differ really, and it's the one that you can work with that's important. And in conclusion, we know it's a life-threatening situation. We don't have level of A evidence medications. Each patient should be treated individually based on the etiology and the hemodynamic subsets and as well as experience because you have to know what you're doing with lots of these devices and medications. Tight control, close observation and re-evaluation in hospital and out hospital is very important. And although they are simple problems, Please do not forget anemia, fever, diabetes, renal function. These are things that we treat the patient with heart failure and think that we're doing, great, uh, doing a great job, but at the end of the day, day, because we haven't treated, let's say, the fever, the patient is going to do worse than we thought. Thank you very much.